Stories of Transformation is a show dedicated to the voices of social justice movements. We bring to you guests who are engaged in making a difference in the lives of those who are forgotten. We are committed to finding solutions which make people safe and communities thrive. We believe that people have powerful stories about personal transformation. When shared, these stories begin a process of healing. Welcome to Stories of Transformation. Welcome to Buna Che Presents. Tonight we start a new series called Stories of Transformation. You have known this show as Create Peace at Home. We have finished those series and wanted to bring you stories of families and people living with mental illness and experiencing raising our children who have a mental illness or might also be using drugs. Often we do not think of mental illness as an illness, we usually think of the person being mentally ill. We have to change this. We also think of people as drug addicts instead of as a human being who's having issues with the use of drugs. Mental illness is a complex issue. Stopping the stigma, the stereotyping, and the prejudices that exist towards the people that we love, we raise, and who are our family members. Tonight, we're going to concentrate the entire time of the show on the story of Kayla Moore, who died in the custody of the Berkeley Police Department on February the 13th. The, fa the Moore family has had to wait three months to get the coroner's report. As a mother who lost a child to mental illness, I can tell you that waiting and not knowing the cause of death of your child is an excruciating experience. We need to reach out to this family and we need to organize to get justice for Kayla Moore. In the studio with me tonight is Arthur Moore, the father of Kayla. Welcome Arthur. Thank and you I for just want me. to share with you that many of us in the community are here for you and will be here for you until we get all the answers that we need to get to to find some resolution to what happened that night. Yes. So if you could start for me and share, you know, what happened? Well, it was close to three o'clock in the morning. I was just getting ready to go to, to work. And the phone rang. And the only information that was given to us was that Kayla was taken to the house hospital, Alta Bates, and she was unconscious when she arrived there. So we got to Alta Bates, and the doctor uh, gave us the news that uh, Kayla wasn't breathing, wasn't breathing when she got there. And uh, he tried to get a pulse, but he was unable to get a pulse. And uh, that was shocking. It was like uh, something that none of us were prepared for. How old is Kayla? Kayla was 41 years old. Uh, she would have been 42, April 17th. And I was uh, just, uh, I, I kept waiting for the doctor to say something else mm -hmm. other than what he was saying. But all he said was that uh, I couldn't get a pulse, I'm, I'm sorry. And uh, we were devastated. Uh, from that point on, there was no information about uh, what had happened. Um, there was no information about anything. We just arrived there, mm -hmm. and um, Kayla's body was there, and we were left with this very empty feeling mm -hmm. because there was nobody at that point to tell us anything except that we had to leave the hospital and, and go, go back home. And when we tried to get some information, uh, it seemed as if they were unwilling to give us information. Um, there seemed to be a lot of confusion on their part. There was, we wanted answers, but there, was, there were no answers. Uh, the disappointment that I felt at that moment, I just can't describe to you. Because uh, it goes with, you know, it, shock the, and... Sure it does. You're, it, you're, uh, just, it's, you're, you're just, uh, you're at a point where you can't think. 
and uh, you want someone to help you with this, but there's really no one to help you with this. Was the police present at the hospital at that time? And were they not able to give you any information as to, you know, who brought Kayla in, or, yeah. you know, what had happened just from, before? From what I understood, uh, Kayla was brought in. I'm not sure whether there was police presence there or not. There should have been, but I'm not sure whether there was or not. It, uh, we were just left alone with the fact that Kayla was dead, and that was that. And there was nothing after that except uh, wait for the coroner's report. Later on, mm -hmm. and on uh, the telling of the story, we'll get into some more details. But I, I would really like to know, and I'm sure the community wants to know, mm -hmm. you know, what was Kayla like? What was Kayla's life like? And, um, you know, many people think that because a person has a mental illness, that somehow their life is limited. Mm -hmm. But my experience of working with people with mental illness for 45 years now is that that experience of being with someone who is, you know, aware of uh, their illness, but yet are not their illness, that right. they're this full human being that the community sometimes tries to dehumanize. And that's a very sad part in this culture, at least, that we do, we cannot separate the illness from the person. That's true. No, Kayla was a very special child. Uh, we knew that. I knew Kayla was special when she was born. Mm -hmm. And uh, when I say special, I'm not talking about she was special in one way or another, but uh, her specialness had a lot to do with um, a commitment, even at a young age. At a young age, she was uh, a child. And there were certain things that uh, parents do when they have children. First of all, you love your children. Mm -hmm. And you want the best for them. And when Kayla was, um, say, around five or four, uh, just a normal child, just wanting to be loved and wanting to go outside and play and, and uh, do all the things that children do. Uh, Kayla uh, suffered uh, an accident, I think when she was about five years old, and she was taken to the hospital. It was a, it was a cranial mm -hmm. uh, concussion from a car accident. And uh, she appeared to be herself, but uh, there was some irregularities as time went on that showed that there was something about the accident mm -hmm. that may have caused it. We weren't very sh we weren't sure at all. Yeah, we it's difficult, sure. but head trauma. Yeah, it was head. You know, it's, um, yeah, it, it, it was, has a permanent impact on one's life. And you, and you don't have anything to go on, so you're not uh, looking at this person as being strange. Mm -hmm. You know, they're just a kid. Yeah. But uh, as Kayla got older, uh, there were some inconsistencies with what children would act like and what they wouldn't act like. And so um, as time went on, Kayla exhibited some of the behaviors that uh, kids exhibit when, when they've suffered a trauma. Mm -hmm. and she, she indeed suffered a trauma when she was yes, in that accident. Young. So from that point on, and again, to answer your question, was she special? Uh, Kayla was just special in many ways. Uh, one thing that I noticed about Kayla was her, uh, she had a certain amount of integrity, a certain intensity, mm -hmm. uh, a certain clarity even, because of the way that sh she looked at life. And even though life was looking back at her in a certain way, yeah. she just remained Kayla. Uh, I think at a very young age, I'd say maybe around 12 or 13, I think Kayla understood uh, the commitment to, first of all, being herself. And that was probably hard at that time for people mm -hmm. to understand. It, it is. Yes. Especially at that very tender age. At that age. When a young person is just starting to develop their identity. Right. And their own image of themselves. Yes. And not being always totally accepted. Yes. And, you know, even be teased or questioned uh, is a very difficult teenage years. That's right. Those are hard years. I remember, uh, I think I've told the story before about uh, Kayla being in a uh, track meet. And Kayla 
on your March cassette, go. And they all took off and Kayla was there just struggling and just her little hands were just, mm -hmm. just, just going a mile a minute. She was just like Jesse Owens and she was flying. And even though she was in the back of the pack, she acted like she was in the front of the pack. Mm -hmm. And of course she lost the race and I went up and uh, I said, you ran a good race, that was, that was wonderful. And so, you know, she says, well, but I lost. I lost the race. And I said, mm -hmm. but that didn't matter. I said, you ran a good race because you see, with Kayla, it was all about not the shoes she was wearing. And it wasn't, uh, if she were here right now, it wouldn't be the building that she, mm -hmm. was, she was in. It was the freedom in her heart, in her soul. It was the commitment to run the race. She made a commitment to have faith in who she wanted to be. And, and no did that else. commitment to being her authentic self continue as she got older? Oh, yes, 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 of course. She, she knew the commitment of trying to uh, get the needs that she needed and to, she had a sense of where she wanted to go with this. Mm -hmm. But as you know, there was nowhere to go. Um, she, she had um, a lot of difficulty in um, finding a pathway from here to where she needed to be. There was really no help for her, except her family. Uh, her sister, me, uh, other people in the family, uh, she knew that we had her back. Mm -hmm. She didn't have to worry about that. She knew that the love was there, the support was there, but she was running into, of course, other obstacles because a lot of people, as you mentioned, they just didn't know yeah where she fitted. She knew where she wanted to fit. And we don't make enough um, space in our own hearts right. to accept folks that are a little different. Yes. And before we even get to know the person, we start putting labels on them. And once that labeling starts, it's almost like it never ends. Yeah, um, you're, you're, you're completely fighting at all, all times. The time. uh, I remember, uh, Kayla saying one day, uh, she was in her room and she was jumping up and down on the bed. She just kept jumping up and down. And she said, uh, Dad, I don't understand why people don't accept me for who I am. And I told her then, I said, well, on this planet, people may not accept you for who you are, but people should accept you for mm -hmm. who you are. I said, you're right. But uh, that's it's very hard for some people to do. And she did have, uh, a group of small friends uh, that that really enjoyed her for her, and that was pretty much her her social group. Yeah, small, there there are uh, people who recognize you as special. Yeah, and yeah. there and it is uh, you know a certain kind of specialness mm -hmm. that we are, we find hard to accept right. because what we think is exactly like what what a person might be exhibiting on a particular day or having a harder time one day and not so much the other. I just wanted to uh, say to the audience that um, we want you to get involved in ending stigma in the community. And uh, please get in touch with an organization called Peers in Oakland, California, and uh, get their materials and join their to stop stigma. I have the bracelet on. It says, stigma stops with me. Please join this movement. It's critical that, um, that we really start looking at our children, our sisters and brothers, our partners who live with a mental illness, that they, they feel accepted and they feel that they are part of this community and they give back a lot to this community. And we need to really start to learn from people who have the illness and not folks that we think are the illness. Um, I've been very involved with uh, people who, um, you know, live an entire life um, at different times, you know, able to manage their mental illness. At other times, not so able to do that. So did you have times where it felt like Kayla really needed more help and might need to be hospitalized or, um, or were you able to 
you know, find good services for Kayla yeah, all so, the time. Yeah, it, it was a little bit of both. Uh, we, we knew that she needed some sort of help. Mm -hmm. And uh, there were certain, uh, there was a school that Kayla was going to. And uh, it was the first time that I ever saw Kayla embraced by everybody, accepted by everybody. I mean, they loved her. I mean, you know, as you mentioned, her authentic mm -hmm. self. And yet there was um, a point uh, as she got older that she needed more help, more structure in, uh, in, in guiding her through this mm -hmm. difficult time for her. So she had uh, really a confusion of somewhat to know exactly where to be. And of course, it was up to us to make the right decision. And um, Kayla was never looked upon as someone that needed to be thrown into a hospital mm -hmm. or, in, or, or thrown into a psychiatric ward. But there were things that uh, professional people could help her with and uh, assist uh, with her. So yeah, uh, it was I was reading the coroner's report, and you know, I will be talking with other members mm -hmm. of the family about that in more detail. There was a time when you had to um, call mental health services or the Berkeley Police Department to get a oh, 5150. Yes. Uh, that, how was that for you as a parent? Oh, it was terrifying. It was terrifying for her and it was terrifying mm -hmm. for me. Uh, we forget how terrifying it is <laughs> for the person who's actually well, experiencing it. Yes. Um, well, I knew that it was terrifying for her because I'm her father and I mm -hmm. love her. And I, I could see that this wasn't going to be easy for her or for me. But yeah, they came, uh, lots of people came. I've never <laughs> professional people in my room, mm -hmm. in my house. And uh, they were merely saying that we need to uh, get her to a better place and uh, would she uh, be willing to go. So uh, she, uh, she left. Was and, this uh, a mixture this of police, mental health workers? Actually, um, there was a lot, there were, there were lots of police there and mm -hmm. I can't remember whether there was a mental health person there or not. There may have been, there may not mm -hmm. have been. Uh, it, was, it was a confusing time. It was uh, just, for, for me, it was kind of sad in a way. Cause yeah, you, it is very sad because the numbers of times that mm -hmm. my son was 5150, it made such a big difference when, if the mental health team showed up first right. and did the assessment. Right. Because once, you know, our officers in uniform show up, if they're not really fully trained, uh, they can trigger a situation yes. by well, just the wrong use of language or, and you know, I'm sure they don't mean harm, but harm happens that's right. because there's a lack of training. That's right. And that's why I think it's critical that we bring back more mental health workers to respond to the crises that our children oh, have in this community. Yeah, absolutely, because if somebody really has a crisis, and they see guns and a lot of noise, mm -hmm. and it, it really is noise to them when they're when they're being uh, shaken like that. Um, they they need to be addressed in a really different way. You can't uh, just you just can't talk in Greek when the person understands Latin. Mm -hmm. You have to you have to be able to um, to relate. Uh, I think in Kayla's case that w that was not the case at all. I think uh, they busted into her apartment and made a lot of accusations. Um, she's there minding her own business and all of a sudden policemen are inside of her apartment accusing her of this, accusing her of that. And um, on a good day, that would rile me. Mm -hmm. I think um, in that particular case, I think it was so mishandled. I, I just can't go on to tell you it was just mishandled. I'm not a professional person, but that indeed was mishandled. I mean, I think uh, a person who was not professional would say, wait a minute, this, we, we're not making ourselves clear here. And as far as women are concerned, all, they, all they're clear about is, well, do we have our handcuff, handcuffs, hand, handcuffs? And uh, they're ready to make arrests and go and pursue in a, in a criminal way. And you can't pursue in a criminal way when you don't know all the facts. Yeah, it's yeah. Um, really unfortunate as to how many people with a serious mental illness are in our prison system. 
and to criminalize mental illness is it's oh. so dehumanizing. Yes. And to then put people who need help in an institution where they're where, going to be abused. Where, where there is no help. And, and there's no help. And there's no help. Um, yeah. it's, we, we have much to change in this city, in this country. Yes. I really want to say thank you for joining us. Is there one thing you want the community to remember Kayla by? Well, I'll tell you what, I'll... Please. I'll let you um, hear from Kayla herself. Oh, that's fantastic. Is that one of her drawings? Actually, the, uh, Kayla was a very gifted uh, poet. At 15 years old, she got... Um, this particular piece was, uh, was published in a magazine called Creation. It's a Native American magazine. And uh, if you read some of her poetry, it, 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 it'll just astound you. Uh, if, if you will, I'll, I'll read Please. this. Yeah, this is called My Outer Skin. The time of day where I like to stay can open and release my shell. But the hurt within can start and begin. My outer skin, you can tell. The lies and uncomfort I gave myself, it's myself I'm starting to ask. The lies turn into clay, it hardened that day, and now I'm wearing a mask. One day will come, the hurt will run, the mask will peel off again. My life I'll face and give it a base, I'll shed my outer skin. It gives you a sense of... It gives me a sense of the brilliance and also how much this, this, in touch <laughs> Kayla was with herself. This is just one that I saw. Yeah. I saw one other and it really, it really says a lot about what she was after. Mm -hmm. This is called Just What I Wanted. That's the title. Just What I Wanted was a peace of mind. Mm to glow and show in the midst of mankind. But now my heavenly wish has sunk into the earth. My memory is reborn again for whatever it is worth. The image in the mirror shouts and screams my past. I turn away, there's the break of day. My world is leaving me fast. Life has hit the ground. Souls aren't being haunted. I'm looking beyond the mirror. I've got just what I wanted. Thank you, Arthur, so much. You're welcome. And I, I would love to ha you know, have you back, say six months from now, a year from now, and see if through all the work that we're committed to doing, to finding out what really happened and what was the cause of death, that you will yes. be able to come back and share Thank share you. more with us. Thank you. I'm looking and forward to I it. And I hope this is the beginning of a new friendship. It is. Thank you for including me in this story. Thank, Thank you, you so much. Welcome back to Stories of Transformation. I'm your host, Buna Chima. About the life of Kayla Moore, much loved by family, who lived and struggled with a mental illness. In the studio with me are her sister, Maria, and Maria's partner, Carl, and a good friend of Kayla's, and often a caretaker for Kayla. Absolutely. We would like to sort of shift the conversation towards more as to what happened that day that Kayla died in the custody of Ber the Berkeley Police Department. They responded to a call, but it clearly seems from reading the coroner's report, which didn't, wasn't really made available for three months, and the family had to wait and struggle and go to city council meetings and speak in the community, demanding that this report be released so that the cause of death could be established. Well, the report has been released. It is very detailed, and it has many contradictions. We're going to talk about the report, but before that, I just want to welcome both of you and offer our condolences and also know that we are in struggle with you to find justice for Kayla. 
So welcome. Thank you. Maria, Thank you. you have been reading the report. Mm -hmm. uh, there are pieces in the report that are clearly, you know, that it, something doesn't quite jive, if I may use that word. Yeah. So can you please speak to that? Um, just first off to say that reading that report was, was so difficult. Um, it, it really took uh, a lot out of me to, to read it, but I had to, to, to do it, and I was amazed at just the inconsistencies. It didn't make sense why they were there. Um, they responded to a disturbance where the caller specifically said and clearly said, this person is, needs to be 5150 the officers arrive at the scene, and Officer Brown, in particular, decided to run a warrant check on the person who made the phone call, the so-called victim, and decided to run a check on Xavier, on Kayla. To Kayla's residence uh, because Kayla was having a psychiatric break and told the police that this person needed to be 5150, they were off their medication. They had this information when the police arrived, they knew this information. They had known Kayla previously for uh, um, uh, several months ago when uh, she was 5150 um, at my dad's house. They were there um, during that time mobile crisis was involved. They were able to de-escalate Xavier, calm him down, and uh, you know, with no incident, take him to the hospital where he was hospitalized and taken care of. They did not do that this night. This night, um, for one thing, Berkeley does not have mobile crisis after hours, which is unfortunate because that's when most people have psychiatric breaks, that's mm -hmm. when they have issues, and that's when they need mobile crisis the most. What they got instead <clears throat> were cops um, who came there not to de-escalate, not to find out what happened. They came there to arrest my brother. And what was that based on? Because I've gone through the police report and it's kind of contradictory. You know, they say that there was a warrant out, but right. then later they say maybe that warrant, warrant wasn't any good because the birthday didn't match. So mm -hmm. if you would clarify that for us a little bit. Officer Brown came on the scene and she had a warrant check ran, run on the person who made the phone call as, as well as Xavier. The person who made the phone call did have an active warrant in San Francisco. They could not confirm a warrant for Xavier. They could not uh, verify that. And Officer Smith told that information to Officer Brown. This warrant is, may not be uh, active. It may not even be Xavier Moore. She took that information, and the first thing she did when she went into Xavier's apartment and noticed that Xavier was actively psychotic, which is not a crime. He was in his apartment, mm -hmm. he was calm. He was talking about the FBI, maybe it didn't make sense. But the first thing she did was let him know about the warrant and that he was being arrested. Even but, though it was clear that, that he, uh, and we're using Kayla and Xavier because um, Kayla was transgender. So I just wanted to clarify that for people so you know that we're talking about the same person. Right, and, and you know, Xavier has always respected the fact that I call him Xavier. And I, and I love, and, I, and you know, we, we had an understanding regarding that. Mm -hmm. um, you know, Xavier had lived in Berkeley for about six to eight months and had uh, incidents with the cops uh, where mobile crisis was called, and they were able to um, to calm him down and take care of him. That night, Officer Brown decided that she wanted not to help Xavier, not to de-escalate the situation, but to take him to jail. And what she did was she, she escalated him by bringing up the issue of the warrant. And when you're going to assess someone for a 5150, the first thing you do is you also bring an ambulance with you. You that was, I was very surprised by that. No, that right. the call was made saying, you know, uh, Xavier is having an episode mm -hmm. and uh, needs to be 5150. Yeah. The ambulance always shows always up. Shows the fire up. department shows up sometimes before even the police shows up. Right. So uh, clearly, this. Uh, 
this must be very, very disturbing for you. It is, because none of the officers on the scene were crisis intervention trained. They had no mental health uh, training, nothing, to, nothing um, no tools to go in there to help them de-escalate Savior. Someone who is psychotic is not a danger to themselves or others. They're just psychotic. Mm -hmm. He wanted to call the FBI. So be it. Have him, have him hand him a phone and say, fine, call. Yeah. But what you don't do is immediately then put hands on him and try to take him down. And that's what they did. Um, Officer Smith informed Officer Brown, even before she went up there to see Xavier, that this warrant was not confirmed. In fact, you know, in their system, he did not have one. They could not confirm it. The date of birth was incorrect. She chose to make a call to arrest him instead of getting him services. There was no, no ambulance there. The ambulance was called after Xavier stopped breathing. And, you know, at that point, when you put your hands on someone who's psychotic and they don't see you as a police officer, they're going to act out, and that's what happened. This situation could have been prevented. It should have been prevented. Uh, I hold Berkeley Police Department responsible for not training their officers. I hold Officer Brown responsible for not following protocol. I think, you know, Berkeley Mental Health plays a role in this. There should be mobile crisis 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Um, I just want to uh, say a couple of things uh, for people who are watching the show. The city of Berkeley had a, f a fully staffed mobile crisis unit, which was available seven days a week. However, during the past few years of cuts, the mobile crisis team is not available 24-7, and Berkeley Police Department has to step into the role of being, uh, you know, mental health workers. But what's missing here, or it seems what's missing is that not enough officers are trained to step in in that role. And we as a community have to look at, is that a role for our Berkeley Police, for our officers? Uh, when a crime is not being committed, when someone is clearly escalated, that they need to be 5150, or a mental health provider needs to be there with the police officers, that we need to make some changes and make sure that we don't put people at risk, whether they are uh, loved ones or even if they're a police officer. Because if they're not trained, they don't know what to do. And from what you're saying, mm -hmm. um, is that encouraging the police department and the, the city to, to, you know, to find the money to fund mm -hmm. mental health services to a level that we don't lose anybody because untrained people showed up. Right, because this will happen again. When you criminalize someone for being mentally ill, and that's the police mentality, this will happen again. Um, you know, it's... <sighs> Why don't you take a few breaths and I'll bring Carl in. Carl, I've been watching you in the community for a couple of weeks now and, um, and really feel how, you know, how hurt and angry and upset you've been, especially one with the delay of the coroner's report. Who did you approach? Where did you go? Did you talk with the city council members? Did you talk with the mayor? Did you demand that this report be released? Please. My first experience with this in trying to get answers was at the Citizens Police Review Board meeting. And at that meeting were the Review Board counselor, the, the, on the, the commission people. Mm -hmm. um, there was uh, Michael Meehan, the chief of the Berkeley Police Department, and another officer that I'm not sure what his name was. Um, I saw Meehan basically beating around the bush, not wanting to give answers, actually lied a few times. Um, blatantly lied when he was asked uh, when the coroner's report would be released and he stated that he had no control over that, that the two separate departments, the Alameda County Sheriff's Department and the Berkeley Police Department, two separate things, he, there's nothing he can do about it, which turned out to be a lie because later the coroner's office confirmed that in fact the Berkeley Police Department had asked the Alameda County Coroner's Office to withhold the coroner's report release. Um, basically, I think covering their, their bases. I, I think they, 
thought all this would be but swept three under the rug. months is a very long time. It's a long time. And during right. that time, yeah. there was also so a district long. attorney investigation going on, so they right. could have clearly told you that there's an investigation going on. They could have said it's been a lot. denied by Michael Meehan. It's been denied by the mayor. He denied having any knowledge of it um, on a radio station the morning of the city council meeting that I was thrown out of. Um, he. Uh, it's just, it's just been a series of lies and attempted cover-ups and disrespect to the family. This is a long-term Berkeley family. They've been here That's for right. years. It's yeah. a good family. Um, and to have this issue of a loved one losing their lives. You know, Mr. Moore lost a child. Yeah. That's a, that's a parent's worst nightmare. Mm -hmm. Maria lost a loved one, a brother, Kayla, who, who is a great person, a fantastic person. Mental health issues, yes. Is it worth dying for? Is it worth the police officers coming in there and doing what they did? And then the disrespect that continues to this day? I'm, I'm thoroughly disgusted by the entire situation. The other piece that uh, worries me a little bit is that uh, what the report does say is that there was presence of drugs. And yet it's not conclusive mm -hmm. as to whether that had anything to do with the cause of death. But what happens to our community sometimes is that instead of wanting real answers, they will say, oh, the person was mentally ill. Oh, look, drug addict. Mm -hmm. And that gives them an excuse. They give themselves an ex excuse right. to have dehumanized the person right. and say, oh, they brought it upon themselves. Mm -hmm. And that is something that we have to continue to educate people about, that anyone at any time in their life can have an episode of mental illness anyone at any time in their life can fall towards uh, the use of drugs for self-medication we we know that not only mentally ill people use drugs we know that in the city of berkeley use of drugs is everywhere and to then just you know try to put those mm -hmm. extra labels as though that will make uh, the loss any less right. or the suffering any less. And I think that's what frustrates me the most because mental illness and drug addiction go hand in hand sometimes. Yes, they do. And, you know, Xavier was schizophrenic before he was a drug addict. Mm -hmm. You know, he did, yes, he was on drugs that night, but that is not who he is. And that's what they want to, per, you know, portray. Just the drug addict. Well, you know, he kind of did it to himself. No, he didn't. Very small amount of drugs. This, the, very, very small. You, you know, yes, and if anyone that. who ha has uh, someone in their home who's mentally ill or a family member, they know this. And they're trying to mask it and hopefully, you know, the public doesn't want to see the police as bad. I get that. So what they want to do is then make the victim the bad person. That's not, we're not going to let that happen. Well, we have a police department that, you know, the community believes is an excellent police department, mm -hmm. but we also have other sections of the community mm -hmm. that have different experiences with the police department. Correct, yeah. And sometimes, you know, it depends on whether the call comes from the hills or the call comes from, you know, right. Right. Uh, south or South Berkeley. Yeah, south, south Berkeley. Berkeley. Mm -hmm. right. The response can be very, very the different. Higher tax revenue. In yeah. this particular case, the number of officers that were involved was stunning. And all their statements are in the coroner's report. Mm -hmm. I believe there were as many as eight different right. folks responding to this call. And uh, how many were actually involved in putting on the handcuffs and tying the ankles and mm -hmm. having Kayla on, you know, face down on the yeah. bed? Right. Do you want to speak to that, Carl? I don't know exactly how many. It, it, it's confusing. Maria's been reading more of the p report than I have, but there were people on her, on her back. There were people restraining her wrists. There were people trying to secure her ankles. Um, there was an inconsistency because somewhere in the report it said that they were outside and Kayla had pulled them in, um, which didn't add up because Kayla ended up on her stomach mm -hmm. with them on her back. Mm -hmm. So if she's pulling them in, at what point in time was she, when was she spun around and slammed down on, you know, it, on her face, you know, with them landing on her back? There's, there's so many inconsistencies in the report. The night of the city council meeting, um, I was actually watching the proceedings of the city council meeting mm -hmm. and uh, saw uh, the, es the escalation again. Right. Not just on, uh, you were just trying, 
Storm, asking for answers stormtroopers. and using the two minutes that you had to, right. to say what you needed to say. And then all of a sudden, there was a police officer on you. Uh, what happened? Did somebody call for an intervention? or The mayor. What had happened was there was a couple speakers speaking on the subject of Kayla. It was obvious that I was going to speak on the same subject because I was there holding a picture um, while Mr. Moore and then Maria spoke. Um, it came my turn and all of a sudden the mayor didn't want to hear any more on that subject so he tried to shut it down. And this is... This, yeah, is, there's Berkeley. A, this, this is Berkeley. Cool. There's a line of people waiting to speak on this issue. Not everybody there, but quite a few people wanted to speak on this. Um, this was an important subject and he, he didn't want to hear it anymore. And I think a big reason of that is um, that morning he had been caught in a lie on a radio station where he in fact denied knowledge of uh, the Kayla Moore issue didn't know who Kayla Moore was, didn't have any information. Um, the only thing he would say is, uh, that's an Alameda Coroner's report um, that their department is handling this. I don't know anything else. What but, could the mayor have done differently from the very beginning? Listen. Just like everybody, you know, just, just listen. Let people have their say. This is a painful issue for people. Mm -hmm. This family's and gone. And acknowledge that this person died in your city at the hands of your cops. Just acknowledge it, but he didn't want to know that, he, he had no knowledge of it. You know, that's insulting. Um, and then to shut us down when we're trying to I mean, The amount of officers that swarmed in was ridiculous. And a couple of them were the same officers that, that were there were the night. The night Kayla died. Exactly. Cardoza and then another one, I forget, yeah. Yeah, Absolutely. there was the same, same so ones. So the level of sensitivity right. is definitely okay. right. If they're missing. willing to escalate at that at an incident at a city council meeting, can you imagine what happened at that apartment? Yeah. I mean, was it six or seven officers swarm on one person because they want to speak at a public forum? Right. Now, while we were speaking on the steps before we came into the council chambers, I looked up, there was windows above the steps where we were speaking. There were several officers throughout the period of time that we were out there having our, uh, our little protest. Um, and they were peeking out the windows and mm -hmm. you could tell we were the focus of, uh, they knew we were coming in. They knew we were coming into the council chambers. And it was a, an amazing day because starting at five o'clock, we were celebrating the life of Maud Al-Shari, right. who was, you know, a human rights activist. Yeah. And always, you know, willing to listen. And... Um, Madel knew this family for Yeah, if she had been there years. that day, she would have come downstairs yeah. and, and joined the rally. Right. And the rally was clearly nonviolent, clearly exactly. peaceful. Right. Yes. But yet to have that police presence sometimes really keeps people from speaking the truth. Right. Because there is fear. Even though even we might have the best officers in the world, but they're still uniformed, they're mm -hmm. armed, and if you're going to say something controversial, there's, there is fear. I think it's their goal to squelch us, honestly. They, they don't want um, what's going on to be public knowledge. They've been trying to shut it down since the very beginning. Um, they were talking about a police chief who, who sent uh, police officers, 10 of them, to find his son's cell phone. You know? It, 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 same person, same police chief that sent police officers by a reporter's house in the middle of the night to get him to change the facts of a story. This particular police chief has a, has a history of this and, and we're seeing it firsthand now. Um, I think there needs to be serious change at the top. The police chief, the mayor, um, and now it looks like the city attorney is trying to shut it down because she stepped in and prevented the Citizens Police Review Board from investigating the police officers any further. Isn't the Police Review Commission's uh, charge to that when an incident like this happens in the city to fully investigate that's it? That's the way I understood At least it. That's how I've understood right. it in all the years that... Uh, well, this lady used to represent, she was a, a defense lawyer apparently, and she used to defend uh, police officers um, in situations such as this. This is the person who staffed to the Police Review Commission, correct? She's yeah. the one who put an end to the investigation. The Police uh, Review She's, Commission, um, they had voted to begin an investigation. This was uh, back in March. This last meeting, the city manager or attorney... City manager, yeah. She, no. um, she said that they couldn't do it. So she, she nixed that. I guess that's her right to do, but why? So, you know, too many unanswered questions. They're, they're trying to 
keep this low key, maybe hoping it will go away, maybe hoping the public won't feel compassion for someone with a mental health issue. I don't know, um, but... It's beyond that, though. We, we really need to have a response team right. that is fully trained. Yes. And, and I know that uh, the police officers in Alameda County get mm -hmm. because it's the same training that Oakland gets and right. the same training that Berkeley gets and I haven't been able to get my hands on the entire 38 hour mm -hmm. module because I've offered to look at it review it because I have a history of working with folks that you know do need mm -hmm. uh, services yes. and also need the services of our police department yeah. and on they need to just open it up a little, you right. know, let the community in, look at the training, uh, give feedback, yeah. and, uh, you know, yeah. you know when stand they, tall again. Yeah, exactly. Because yeah. this particular incident has a lot of people concerned, even though we're not hearing that yet. Yeah. And I'm hoping that by doing this show tonight and then, you know, trying to get on the CIT Council mm -hmm. and trying, to, you know, take this as far as possible because once you hear that story you know and read the report it's really clear that everything did not go the That's way right. policy and procedures are. if if they were followed uh, Kayla would have been 51 50 right. and in a hospital getting care yeah. so where where do you go from here we create change. You have the report. We, we create change and that's what this is about because this will happen again if nothing happens. We need to change the policy of how they handle um, mental health, people in crisis. You know, there's been other instances in Berkeley where their first response is to take you down and put a spit mask on you. Yes. So, you know, they need better training with their officers. They need more around the clock mobile crisis. They just need so much more that, you know, um, they need to look in their budget and find it because they can. And right now they don't want to because they don't feel the pressure, but, you know, that will change because this, this cannot happen again. It should not have happened in the, in the beginning. And I was so happy, I think my dad was too, that when Xavier moved to Berkeley, we felt relieved. Mm -hmm. We were like, whew, okay, he's close, he's in an area where they, he can get help and services. This is Berkeley, this, they're liberal, they, they would probably embrace someone like Xavier. That, that's honestly what I thought. And since he's been in Berkeley, that has not been the case. You know. Um, that, that is really unfortunate. Um, we need to fix the Berkeley Mental Health Department and we definitely need to get our officers trained better and that is my plea to folks who are listening. You know, call your city council member, find out what's happening, uh, find out what initiative they're taking to bring truth to light. Um, it's been just incredible getting to know both of you. Courage and strength really comes through. I know it's been an awful time. Uh, three months is a long time to be waiting to find out how a loved one died. Yes. Um, just want you to know you have our strong support, you have my support, and uh, let's, let's make some real change and create some transformation in the city of Berkeley. Any last words, Carl? This family deserves better. From, mm -hmm. The city deserves better than what they've been given in this situation, whether it be gay rights, human rights, mm -hmm. civil rights, the Bill of Rights, every single right that you can label is being violated in Berkeley by the system that's in, in place. Yeah. And there has to be a desire, and once again, I believe the, the problems lie at the top of the food chain, the police chief and the mayor. They have to insist on change because if they're not part of the, yeah, the solution, after, they're definitely yeah, part of the problem. After having watched the criminalization of homeless folks, mm -hmm. um, we have, ac and you know, interactions between the police and uh, folks who are homeless, you know, getting, asking people to get up who are sleeping, right. you know, just violating rights mm -hmm. yeah. openly in our streets. Right. That we've actually uh, teamed up with 
Assemblyman Tom Amiano from San Francisco and mm -hmm. have introduced a California Bill of Rights, Homeless Bill of Rights, and it passed through committee, goes to, I think, judiciary next, uh, actually tomorrow. And so we're all in different ways trying to, you know, bring light to the violation of basic human rights mm -hmm. of people who we call Americans, who we call our own. Mm -hmm. These right. are our kids. These are not, you know, folks that came from somewhere that nobody knows where they came from. Right. Mm -hmm. um, we have to start treating human beings as precious lives and precious human beings, irregardless of, you know, what their mental state is right. or what else what other struggles they might be facing. I, I mean, uh, Xavier lived his life honestly and with no excuses. And, I, um, you know, I envied that. He, he was honest and mm -hmm. I don't want him to be viewed as just a paranoid schizophrenic with drug issues. He was so much more than that. And, you know, I know he's, he would want us to continue on with this, but um, he didn't deserve this. This was my brother. He was such a sweet, bubbly person. His personality was just always upbeat. You know, um, he loved to laugh, he loved to sing. He was a big girl, but he loved to dance. Um, you know, he had a childlike innocence that drew you to him. Um, and when he was living in his psychotic states, he wanted to give you blessings. He wanted to, you know, um, he, he saw spirits behind you that were your angels. It, he wasn't, it, his mind was just free and innocent mm -hmm. that way. So that's how I want him to be remembered. Thank you so much. And like I said earlier, we'll have you back. Thank you. Um, because, you know, the struggle is going to continue and let's continue to ask for answers and I don't believe that there aren't enough people in the city who after hearing the story tonight and becoming more involved won't be asking those questions of the mayor, the police chief and the city attorney. Yes, services to our folks living with a mental illness have to be the very, very best in this country because that's what Berkeley always tries to show itself as, that we do things better, we do more for our people. So, you know, let's, let's continue that's and stay strong. One more thing I really want Absolutely. people to remember that Kayla was in her living room, in her own home when this happened, not out on the streets running wild, in her own home, minding her own business. And where should you be able to feel the safest? You know, this is so sad. This family, I miss Kayla. Maria misses Kayla, her father, her entire family, her friends. And when she was your friend, she was a great friend. Mm -hmm. You know, she, there was no, there, it wasn't fake. Mm -hmm. It wasn't smiling in your face and saying something behind your back. It was real. And I think all of us could take a piece of that and hope that we could achieve what she achieved in that. And I just, um, this world would be a better place if the Berkeley police hadn't shown up there and done what they did and, and taken her away from us. Thank you very much, both of you. Thank you. I invite you to open your hearts and when you see people on the street, try sometime to just say, hey, I'm Buna, it's nice to see you. See what happens when you reach out to people with compassion in your heart and with love. That's what being human is all about. And let's spread that in our city. And let's make our police department more compassionate and our politicians more accountable. Thank you very much for tuning in.